Jared Edelstein here, your celeb expert and your celeb savant. Celeb Savant is a weekly entertainment show. We have long-form career retrospective type interviews with celebrities, singers, actors, and industry experts. With an iTunes number one album to their name and a string of top five singles on national radio charts and other local music award wins, Short Straw have established themselves as one of the biggest bands in South Africa. With their catchy melodies and infectious rhythms, the band has taken pleasure in rocking the most prominent live music festivals, venues and clubs in South Africa and abroad, including successful tours in Europe, Australia and Japan. The band has also had the incredible opportunity to have toured with a number of great international bands in South Africa and abroad, including Pixies, The Cooks in the UK, The Jungle Giants Australia, Bombay Cycle Club UK, Last Dinosaurs Australia, and The Dune Rats in Australia. Short Straw was nominated in the category Best Indie at the 2014 MTV Africa Music Awards, as well as the category Best Rock Album at the prestigious South Africa Music Awards for their albums Youthless in 2016, Those Meddling Kids in 2018, and Find Thanks in You in 2023. Up next on Celebs Front, we've got Russell Grant from Short Straw. How are you doing? What's happening in your life and how are things going? Things are very good, man. We found out today that we were nominated for a Best Rock Album at this year's SAMA, South African Music Awards, which is um, a lovely honour. We've been nominated before. Yes. Twice. Sadly lost twice. Um, and so maybe this year's the year. Uh, what years were you nominated previously? And was it in the same category? Yeah, so it's always been best rock. You you need an award ceremony like the Summers to to realize your place, and I say that in a in a good way, because going to the Summers has you realize just how many diverse acts and mm-hmm. sounds there are out there, and just by virtue of having guitars that often are somewhat distorted, we we very clearly belong in rock. And, and proud to be in it. So yes. um, I forget the exact years, but it was the last two albums. Okay. So, so our last three albums um, in a row have each been nominated, which is lovely. We're at that point now in our career where you have actually released enough that you almost lose count. We know Paul McCartney, but um, I think it is five full-length albums now. Oh, cool. Why the name Short Straw? Uh, so the name actually existed before I joined the band. Okay. Um, and uh, so it was it was very much out of the brain of Alistair Thomas, the singer and frontman. And uh, it was just a general um, nod to uh, being a bit self-deprecating. Yeah, sort of, uh, you know, having drawn the short straw. Yeah, it's just a sort of a general sort of joke of of not taking yourself too serious and, and being a bit self-deprecating. Okay. <laughs> At what age did you think, cool, I want to be in a band or be doing music? And how did that accumulate to meeting the rest of the band, joining them and to where we are today? Yeah, I think like most musicians, you, you start very young. I played drums and I got my first drum kit in primary school. I was like one of the only people in my whole primary school who not only was playing drums, but had a drum kit. So I was always in bands. I probably started my first band when I was in standard two. Standard something, two. <laughs> something silly like that. And and yeah. drumming lessons started from about standard three. Got my first drum kit, standard four. I'm, I'm still, I'm old enough to sorry, still deal in standards, which I'm yeah, I know standards. Old. I don't know the grades. <laughs> um, and 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 so what has been so cool to map is that each band I've ever been in has hit some kind of further milestone. So just the first band, you know, just was exciting enough to write a song. I remember the other band actually recording something in a in a recording studio yes. i mean that was so exciting of course you look back now and really all it was was um the guy like pressing record and 
sort of walking away. (laughs) (laughs) We didn't really do much. And I was, you know, drumming on space cases or sort of boxes or something before I got a drum kit. So, um, you know, dial forward to playing in other bands at Varsity, meeting other bands and, and, and sharing the stage with them. And the members of Short Straw were in another band. Um, I was in another band and, and you get to know each other. And of course you then get to know who can play what. And I was a fan of Short Straw. They, they put out this EP and I heard Alistair sing for the first time because in the previous bands, he was a very quiet bassist. And then I realized this guy's got this incredible voice. And I remember going up to them as friends, as people I've shared the stage with, where I was like, I really love this. EP that you've put out. Yeah. But at that point, they were just a two piece. Um, and so they were missing other musicians. And I just said, you know, just so you know, if you're ever expanding, I'd love to throw my name in the hat as a as a bassist. And at that point, they said, we just agreed to have another guy be the bassist. And I was like, ah, oh, well, that's too bad. And I was a fan of them for about a year or two, watching them perform. I really loved the music. And then one day the call came when they said, you know, that guy, that bassist um, is moving overseas. Do you want to be in the band? And I was like, fuck yeah, because (laughs) I was a genuine fan. And um, the first few rehearsals was so fun for me to actually just be playing the songs that I love. Um, But the band hadn't, hadn't established much. They were bumbling around sort of playing the odd show. And, and, and then pretty much as I joined it, there was this crossroads where other members were now also going to leave. And the question was, would the band continue or or would they stop? And I was like, well, that's a pity. I've just joined. They've had all these songs. We want to put together an album and it could just be a last little hurrah um, just just to document everything we've done. Or this could be the start of something. And then when the album came out, the, the the feeling was like no wait no we 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 must continue here yeah um and that's when um another dude joined and the the short straw people know like then came to be and then from there on we we did it or we gave it a good go and so let's dive into the creative process of creating music is it all of you uh, writing and creating together. Is it one specific person? What is that creative journey? We've, yeah, we've found a, a good balance. It's it's effectively a, a, a big jam with all of us in the room. Um, and a lot gets shaped there musically. Um, Alistair then, as the singer, um, has has like little notes and like little phrases or things he's jotted down and maybe he tries to fit it into what we're jamming or he'll sort of mumble something along the jam and come back with something a bit more solid. So the, the, the lyrics um, is very much living in, in his head. We give our feedback sometimes. (laughs) Um, Sometimes it's maybe something we don't agree with, but for the most part, I mean, I, I think he's one of the greatest lyricists. I've ever heard and I can be somewhat objective because you know the final version of something is gets presented when we're recording and I'm just amazed at, at how his brain works but musically it generally all happens together and so yeah we've we've opted to to split our royalties even for that reason so I've seen you guys perform at festivals opening for George Ezra and so the difference between opening, being at a festival, obviously you bring your, the same amount of energy to each or is some is one performance slightly different to other. Let's unpack the various performances that you guys do. You know, I, I even said this to George himself afterwards. I said, relative to our size, so obviously we're a lot tinier than, um, significantly tinier than George Ezra. We, we've gotten quite used to playing to a warmed up crowd, even yes. if that's one hundredth of, of the size we played with him. And I said to him, I said, I've forgotten what it's like to actually be the guys in charge of warming up. Because it is different. Um it does become a luxury 
to to have a warmed up crowd, a crowd ready and waiting for you, who have come for you, no matter how big that crowd is. But in the same sense, it is obviously nice to reach new people. But, you know, festival crowd is also another story. Festival crowd is, is people that are just excited for everyone, but perhaps a lot of them don't know you. Yes. So it's a sort of a combination of the two, especially especially with the band world where I guess maybe actually any musician, you, you've grown up playing a lot of awkward, strange shows. So yes. you get quite used to dealing with whatever you've been given. But yeah, some, some audiences can be a bit tougher than others, depending on, on, on how warmed up they are. But playing um opening for George Ezra was was exciting. It was it was cool. It, we we did feel like we have to warm up the crowd. So it started perhaps a bit cold, but then there was there was a nice challenge, you know, yes. to, to get ready for the next act. And also I've I've spoken to a number of artists who also said that by warming up or being at festivals is like they don't like you said, they don't necessarily know who you are. So it's a challenge because it's now creating new fans. And creating people who will become, you know, short straw advocates type of thing. Yeah, you got to you you got to often think about you know what's going to make you different, what's going to make you stand out. So it comes down to yeah, what you wear, how you how you do your show at festivals. But yeah, thankfully we've always had people in the crowd that have known us, and yeah, we love a good festival show. For me. I'm always that person right in front. I take my phone out to take a couple of shots, a couple of videos, and I put it away because I find it's too distracting. But I find a lot of people around me are trying videoing the whole time, posting, tweeting, taking photographs. So from the person on the stage seeing a lot of times more phones than faces, do you find that a little bit of disconnect with the energy or do you feel it's just where society is at the moment? I, I must say, I know that there often are phones but it, it doesn't um, it doesn't distract me here. I'm not seeing enough to have it feel um, like we've lost them. Yeah, you know? no, and, and I, I must say I do enjoy seeing that footage the next day because you 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 forget what it's like to or you also have no idea what it's like to to see it the other way. Um, you know your you know your view or yes. you've got your perception of of how the show went and there's been a few cases where you listen back and you go like, ooh, that was a pitch. <laughs> yeah, but the sound quality of a phone is not accurate. No, of course. You gotta yeah. you gotta take it from where it comes. But but sometimes it's you know, the same goes for for sports people, you know, you gotta watch your match afterwards sometimes and sort of see what you see how you're moving or see what you're doing and and and, and realizing what worked and what didn't work. Okay. So I, I do appreciate getting the footage and if it's sharing it with other people, I, I've got no problem with that. I love me a CD. I still buy my CDs. I love the experience of, well, we don't have shops in South Africa anymore, but the experience of going, collecting it, ordering it, unpacking it, looking at the pictures. For me, it's an energy exchange to say thank you to you guys for all the hard work you put in. But we've, And I'm mm. not sure if you're aware that physicals are making a huge comeback. CDs, cassettes, vinyls. And in fact, last year in the UK alone, vinyls sold 5.5 million, the biggest since 1990. But we again, we have yeah. these digital platforms that people experience music on. So what are your perceptions of each? Do you have a preference of each for yourself? Yeah, it's 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 been an interesting journey because we... I would say the 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 busiest period of short straw's life, if it was that chunk, the end of physical CD media was perhaps right in the middle, and so we had an album that we put out that we naturally made. I forget what it was, it was a thousand CDs, um, pretty much on the brink of um, iTunes coming out, and so we constantly. Uh, had this challenge with each album to have a different major format. But even even when it was cassettes and CDs, the economy didn't change. You were buying a physical product. It doesn't matter yes. what form that product came. Um, we witnessed the, the end of CDs and the start of streaming um, over the course of our five-album career. Um, we had our first album go out on Bandcamp, which is like hardly anything anyone sort of does anymore where you pay for 
you pay premium money for a digital download. So it was it was difficult for us to sort of always change the goalposts and figure out what we needed to do. I think we've now settled into streaming. Um, and uh, the album before last, um, we opted to make a very special vinyl because I'm a vinyl collector myself, so yes. I appreciated it. And we made what we thought was a humble amount, which is, I think it was 500 copies of the vinyl, yeah. only to um, have this sort of dawning realization once we had had them shipped to South Africa that a lot of our fans um, aren't these older, nostalgic people who have access to record players. A lot of our fans are young, varsity students, um, high school kids, um, and they... <laughs> They don't have vinyls. So um, we we are sorry, obviously selling the stock as we go. Um, I have no worries about that. But we're not necessarily a vinyl band. But I did it uh, because I wanted that. And it was an interesting challenge. We did a fun um, cassette release simply for the fun of it that all sold. It was a tiny little batch of, of cassette runs. So that was cool and interesting to see that because that yes. very much reminded me of my like primary school era where we were making mixtapes ourselves and traveling around with those like little players that played cassette. So that was fun, and it, but it, but it, for the most part, it's been an interesting challenge to to have to change the approach yes. of literally each album. Literally each of the five albums, there was a different collection of whether physical or streaming. A lot of artists, we have this conversation, we unpack it. And my question is, and a lot of them have said, because the royalties are so low and not like they used to, et cetera, et cetera, and they have to rely on touring, a lot of them have like side hustles. And I know you've got a number of side hustles. Do you believe mm. that you would still have them if the music royalties and money was enough or you love having all the various dippings in different things that you're doing? Yeah, I, I, I must say we all started our own things often before the band even took off. And, and so they were great loves. So for me, my main thing is owning the Bioscope, which is a cinema. I then joined the band about a year, about a year after I started the actual cinema. I, I think for us, it's what's made us special um, in the fact that we each do our own thing that we love. I think it would be different if we found ourselves in in jobs or careers that we hated where all we wanted to do was quit the job and go on the road. We we've had the we've had the blessing of finding our fulfillment in in these other careers as well. And that all of that feeds in. So like for myself we can event and do things. Um I've learned that through the bioscope. We've sometimes used the cinema Alistair is a director and editor, so he's edited every pretty much every short straw music video. Tom is a cinematographer, so he shot a lot when he obviously couldn't be filmed himself. Yep. Jake is a digital marketing strategist, so it's like it all fits in. Gad merchandises and 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 makes stuff and makes candy, and so it all it all feeds into what we do, yep. and and we love that. In terms of how one earns their income, streaming for us has still brought in a good amount of money relative to what it is. The yeah. economy was always going to be different. CD, some bands are more CD sale bands and would make good money there. But, but yeah, I think the money has always been in live performance. Yeah, it's been a lovely, like, second job for us. Yes. And I think we, when we are then on stage and when we are then choosing what we perform, we've had the luxury of only doing the stuff we want to do, where yeah. some of our friends who do do it full time um, have often had to agree to some shows that they probably wouldn't have wanted to do, but <laughs> yes. pays balls. And so that kind of kills a little bit of the love, where for yes. us we have the luxury to go, you know, I don't want to go all that way, or I don't want to do that for that where there have been shows where we want to do it and we're not even going to make that much money, but it sounds so fun. We we can we can have the blessing to have that choice. But I, I think despite our, our side hustles, mm -hmm. if we were perhaps a three-piece, 
at the height of our busyness, which was 2014, 2015, we probably could have given it a full-time go. I think if we were a three-piece, we would have made it work. Um, it's hard. We've chosen to be a five-piece. Splitting that amount five ways, yeah. I, I don't think would would ultimately pay the rent. Okay, so I love this game. I know if I had to ask you this question in one day, two days, five years, I know your answer would be different every time because there's millions of them and I recognize that and I understand that. But if you had to push play to five songs by other artists once we finish this conversation, what would those five songs be and by whom? Um, <laughs> but I have I have those Apple playlists that get made for you once a week. Um, so in my favorites playlist, it always gives me one Rage Against the Machine song. And those obviously change week on week because yeah. Apple knows I love Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> um, I, I love Joburg Traffic with with the band Rage Against the Machine. There's a there's a focus, there's an energy, there's a there's even an anger at some point. So it's, it channels a lot of the, the spirit of Joburg. Um, they're very political band. So it would probably be a Rage Against the Machine song. As a result of that, uh, the band Audio Slave was the band of Rage Against the Machine with the singer of Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, which is no more. They released uh, three albums, and I didn't know about the third, funny enough. So it, it came on my radar recently. I hadn't thought of Audio Slave for a long time. And I kind of discovered this album that I didn't know existed, which was the last Audio Slave album. Somehow it, 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 it had missed me. And so it was almost like finding the the last whisper in the packet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, of, you know, Chris Cornell um, is is no longer alive. Yeah. So there's no more audio slaves. So I found this sort of last album. And it's a really good album. So <laughs> okay. I've been enjoying that. Then recently, um, the band Boy Genius. I got given some vinyls uh, or some vinyl vouchers for my birthday. And so I listened to a bunch of albums ahead of picking which one I would buy on vinyl. There are some artists that just make for perfect vinyl music. And I think Boy Genius and Phoebe Bridges, you know, who's in Boy Genius, like all those people that make up that band just make the most incredible vinyl music, which yes. is very chilled, often dinner party, relaxed, end of the night, quiet end of day music so in amongst <laughs> the the hardcore um rage against the machine it is very cool to occasionally do a little bit of phoebe bridges yeah that's probably the the, ex the extent of my uh listening at the moment the podcast is listened to throughout the world so as a final message to the listening audience what would you like to say hello <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you yeah we've we've been lucky enough to travel and that was one of the, the the nicest gifts was was meeting short straw fans from around the world. I think our music, some of it has um, a, a relatively unique African flavor yeah. um, in some of the in some of the music. Um, that was a conscious effort to um, be proud and own our roots. But at the yeah. end of the day, we also are a bunch of English speaking white guys. So, you know, our, our, our influences are very Western and very um, uh, out there in that regard. So I think the nice combination and the unique flavor I think has made for a lot of short straws charm and success over the years. And I think at the end of the day, we are making happy music. <laughs> I, if someone says, what's your band? What kind of music? I say happy indie rock. Yeah. And I think we all want that happiness. I think we all want that cheekiness. And um, and it's been lovely to, you know, as far as Japan, have people relate to our songs. And so it's it's so it's such a gift that we're making something that can be appreciated across the world. It's a blessing that the music is there and that the music will always be there. That was another lovely realization is that what you make just lives on. Yeah.